Boogie Boogie Jungle Boogie gentle viewer and welcome along to another installment of another online review show as always I'm your humble host Mikey Lavery as I'm sure you're aware at this stage this is going to be a retrospective where I take a look at the work of LA native Quentin Tarantino back in the midst of time Quentin Jerome Tarantino was working at a video store and in his spare time was penning the script for what would become his debut feature Reservoir Dogs eventually the script would end up in the hands of the Weinsteins who greenlit the project now Reservoir Dogs didn't do all that well at the box office but it became a massive hit amongst indie movie fans. In his debut feature, we follow a bunch of criminals who don't know each other and are supposed to only refer to each other by their colour-coded aliases. Mr. Brown, Mr. White, Mr. Blonde, Mr. Blue, Mr. Orange, Mr. Pink. Fun fact for you, the reason that the guys have the colour-coded names that they do in this movie was a reference to the 70s crime flick, The Taking of Pelham 123. Anyway, the gang of criminals have been assembled for a simple jewel store robbery. However, the robbery goes horribly wrong. Some of the gangsters have been shot and killed by the police. This results in them heading back to a disused warehouse to try and figure out why the robbery went wrong. It also has great dialogue. I mean, when I order coffee, I want to fill six times. Six times? Well, you know, what if she's too fucking busy? Words too fucking busy shouldn't be in a waitress's vocabulary. Excuse me, Mr. Pink, but the last fucking thing you need is another cup of coffee. <laughs> Jesus Christ, I mean, these ladies aren't starving to death. They make minimum wage. I know, I used to work minimum wage, and when I did, I wasn't lucky enough to have a job that society deemed tip-worthy. You don't care they'd count on your tips to live? You know what this is? It's the world's smallest violin playing just for the waitresses. There are many reasons I love this movie. Firstly, it can be laugh-out-loud funny in places. For the past 15 minutes now, you've been droning on about names. Toby. 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 Toby Wong. Toby Wong. Toby Wong. Toby Chung. Fucking Charlie Chan. We've got Madonna's big dick coming out of my left ear, and Toby the Jet, I don't know what, coming out of my right. Give me that book. Are you going to put it away? I'm going to do whatever the fuck I want with it. Well, then I'm afraid I'm gonna have to keep it. But well, that's not to say it's a comedy. This is very much a thriller. I didn't create this situation. I'm dealing with it. You're acting like a first year fucking thief. I'm acting like a professional. They get him, they can get you. They get you, they get closer to me, and that can't happen. And you're looking at me like it's my fault? I didn't tell him my name. I didn't tell him where I was from. Shit, 15 minutes ago, you almost told me your name. When this movie was shown at Cannes, director Wes Craven walked out of it for being too violent. Yeah, the guy who gave us Last House on the Left in which a girl is brutally raped and killed found Reservoir Dogs too violent. Kinda hypocritical there, Wes. Also, a lot of people slam this for being overly violent for the sake of being violent. This isn't thrown in there just for the sake of being shocking. Prior to this scene, you are presented with a guy who's quite funny and charming. Then the torture of the cop happens, and it shoves it in the viewer's face that this is a stone cold psychopath that one moment could be laughing and joking with you, and the next moment he could be slitting your throat from ear to ear. After the moment that Mr. Blonde slices the cop's ear off, comes a great black comic one liner. Hey, what's going on? Hey. You hear that? Also, Reservoir Dogs has a fan fucking fantastic soundtrack.
I must address the controversy that swirled around this movie. When it came out, every critic who saw this was falling over themselves to call this the most original movie ever made. But people came up out of the woodwork to say, I'm so shutting there. your butt down. By saying, you do realize that this is a remake of an Asian crime thriller called City on Fire. Then people went to see City on Fire and were like, well, what do you know? All of those people who are saying that Quentin Tarantino essentially remade City on Fire without crediting the original makers of the movie were correct. And if you were royally pissed off about Quentin Tarantino doing this, I totally understand why you're pissed off about it. But I can get over it and still enjoy the hell out of Reservoir Dogs. Given the fact that Reservoir Dogs was appreciated only really amongst indie movie fans, no one could have predicted that his second movie, Pulp Fiction, would go on to become the pop culture phenomenon in 1994. It was impossible to escape parodies of Pulp Fiction. The one scene I recall being parodied the most was this. I mean, they got the same shit over there that they got here, but it's just, it's just there, it's a little different. Example. All right, well, you can walk into a movie theater in Amsterdam and buy a beer. And I don't mean just like a little paper cup, I'm talking about a glass of beer. And in Paris, you can buy a beer in McDonald's. And you know what they call a, a, a quarter pounder with cheese uh, in Paris? They don't call it a quarter pounder with cheese? No, oh, man, they got the metric system. They wouldn't know what the fuck a quarter pounder is. And what do they call it? They call it a Royale with cheese. I'm pretty sure that everybody watching this knows the story to Pulp Fiction, so I'm gonna keep it brief. It's a series of seemingly separate stories about a bunch of LA criminals that as the movie continues becomes interlinked with one another. There's just so much I adore about this movie. First of all, the dialogue is superb. Pilot? What's a pilot? Well, you know the show's on TV? I don't watch TV. Yeah, but you are aware that there's an invention called television and on this invention they show shows, right? Yeah. Well, the way they pick TV shows is they make one show. That show's called a pilot. Then they show that one show to the people who pick shows. And on the strength of that one show, they decide if they want to make more shows. Some get chosen and become television programs. Some don't, become nothing. Maybe at times it sounds a little bit too much like movie dialogue, but for the most part, this sounds like what these characters would actually say to one another. Also, it has my favorite movie speech of all time. Ezekiel 25, 17. The path of the righteous man is beset on all sides by the inequities of the selfish and the tyranny of evil men. Blessed is he who in the name of charity and goodwill shepherds the weak through the valley of darkness, for he is truly his brother's keeper and the finder of lost children. And I will strike down upon thee with great vengeance and furious anger those who attempt to poison and destroy my brothers. And you will know my name is the Lord when I lay my vengeance upon thee. As well as the characters being memorable, the dialogue being cool, the direction being spot on. Above all else, it's a very, very funny movie. Marvin, what do you make of all this? Man, I don't even have an opinion. Well, you gotta have an opinion. I mean, do you think that God came down from heaven and stopped... Oh, what the fuck's happening? Oh, oh man. Shit. Oh, man, I shot Marvin in the face. Why the fuck did you do that? Well, I didn't mean to do it. It was an accident. Oh, man, I see some crazy-ass shit in my time, but just... Chill out, man. I told you it was an accident. You probably... He went over a bump or hey, something. Hey, the car ain't hit no motherfucking bump. Hey, look, man, I didn't, I didn't mean to shoot the son of a bitch. The gun went off. And much like the debut flick Reservoir Dogs, it has an outstanding soundtrack. Then, er, <laughs> in 2006, well, um, this happened.
When I first heard that the Black Eyed Peas was sampling Mizzaloo, I instantly flew into... FUCKING NERVE RIGHT! I was screaming, fuck this, and fuck any of the fuck buckets who like it. Now that I'm a little bit older, but any longer, I don't slag people off who like a song. Each to their own. I'll take the unholy piss on the people who created the song. After the critical and commercial success that was Pulp Fiction, Quentin Tarantino is now the hottest new director in Hollywood. So all eyes are on Quentin to see what his next project would be. And he announced that he was going to be adapting a book by his favourite novelist, Elmore Leonard. He was a massive fan of the guy growing up, to the point that he was arrested for trying to shoplift a book by Elmore Leonard. After racking his brains about what novel he wanted to adapt, he narrowed it down to three choices before settling on Rum Punch. Having never read the novel, I can't tell if Jackie Brown is a good adaptation or not. But considering that Elmore Leonard thinks that Jackie Brown is the best adaptation of one of his books after Get Shorty, I'm gonna think that this is a pretty damn accurate adaptation of his work. Jackie Brown is Quentin Tarantino's love letter to the black exploitation genre. And in case you're wondering what a black exploitation movie is, to the best of my knowledge, a black exploitation flick was a subgenre of the exploitation genre. That featured a largely black cast. They were massively popular in the late 70s but fell out of popularity in the mid 80s. I can't tell you if Jackie Brown is the kind of love letter that gets him a second date or is the kind of love letter that gets him punched in the face. All I know is that Jackie Brown is an extremely solid crime. In this movie, a middle-aged air stewardess by the name of Jackie Brown smuggles money from Mexico to Los Angeles for the arms dealer Ordell Robbie. When she gets caught by the agents Ray Nicolette and Marcus Dagos with $10,000 in cocaine in her purse, they propose a deal to her to help them arrest Ordell in exchange for her freedom. Meanwhile, Ordell asks the 56-year-old Max Cherry, who runs a bail bond business, to release Jackie with the intentions of killing her. Jackie becomes aware of Ordell's plan and cooks up a plan with Cherry to rob Ordell of a half a million dollars. Jackie Brown moves at a far slower pace than its predecessor, Pulp Fiction. I gave a shit about the character of Jackie Brown. I found her to be extremely likeable. She's an extremely poor black woman, so when she gets the opportunity to steal a significant sum of money and get away with it, you understand why she would snap at the opportunity to do so. And yet again, there are many moments in this that are laugh out loud. Uh, 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 here we go. AK-47, the very best there is. When you absolutely, positively got to kill every motherfucker in the room, except no substitutes. Right. Who's that? That's Beaumont. Who's Beaumont? An employee I had to let go. Is that what I think it is? What do you think it is? I think it's a gun pressed up against my dick. <laughs> well, you thought right. Now take your hands from around my throat, Nick. Oh, well, maybe a feds got her. <laughs> See, if there wasn't nothing in that bag but them towels, then maybe she didn't get a chance to take the money out of her suitcase and the ATF got it. But she put them books in there to trick her ass. Well, that's why I didn't check it, because the bag fell... It didn't bother me that this is very much a slow burn crime thriller, as I found the characters in the story to be interesting. Or maybe that's because I didn't see this until I was older. For whatever reason, when I was younger, I didn't bother seeing Jackie Brown. And once again, Jesus, titty fucking Christ, the soundtrack to Jackie Brown is outstanding. I was the third from time. And after a seven year gap, Quentin Tarantino returned with his epic kung fu revenge flick, Kill Bill, which was released in two volumes. But this wasn't always the case. I'm sure that most of you watching this know the backstory behind this, but for those of you who are unaware, it's time for... The reason given was that if this was edited down to one movie, it would lose a lot in terms of character development and story. Great Scott, my bullshit detector is going through the roof! This is nothing more than a cynical ploy to make more money, and it worked, because I and a lot of people went to see Kill Bill Volume 1 and 2 in the cinema. Really me bitching about that? at this point is kind of a moo point. A moo point? <laughs> yeah, it's like a cow's opinion. <laughs> you know, 
It just doesn't matter. And the story for this is not the most complex in the world. It's about a pissed off ex-female assassin that wakes up from a coma and tracks down the people who put her in said coma. And really, are you going to see Kill Bill for a complex plot? Of course you're not. The reason you go and see a movie like Kill Bill is for the great action set pieces. And fuck me sideways Jesus does this movie have great action. <laughs> the soundtrack to Kill Bill Volume 1 is, but at this stage in his career, everybody kinda knew that Quentin Tarantino's movies came packaged with a cool soundtrack. And since the second volume was released several months before the first volume, it opened up with a brief little recap of the events of Volume 1. I looked dead, didn't I? Well, I wasn't. But it wasn't from lack of trying, I can tell you that. Actually, Bill's last bullet put me in a coma. A coma I was to lie in for four years. When I woke up, I went on what the movie advertisements refer to as a roaring rampage of revenge. I roared, and I rampaged, and I got bloody satisfaction. I've killed a hell of a lot of people to get to this point. But I have only one more. The last one. The one I'm driving to right now. And when I arrive at my destination, I am gonna kill Bill. The second half of Kill Bill really slowed the pace down so that you could get to know the characters. Whenever an action sequence does pop up in Volume 2, it's pretty damn cool. slower pace and arguably more mature tone of Jackie Brown, when Kill Bill Volume 1 and 2 came out, a lot of people weren't happy with it. They saw this as a massive step in the wrong direction, and saw it as nothing more than a regression, and that Tarantino was doing nothing more than fueling his inner nerd child by making a movie that paid homage to the violent kung fu movies of his youth. Both Kill Bills didn't piss me off, I thought they were cool, stylish, had great characters and great action sequences, and that's pretty much what I was looking for from Kill Bill, and since we are now at the midpoint of the movies that Quentin Tarantino has made so far. Now is the perfect time to end the first part of this two-part retrospective of Quentin Tarantino's career. <laughs>